Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 37 of the Echo Office Hours. Today, I'm going to be digging further into that uh, issue that I saw a couple weeks ago when we were playing with topology where hints. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna show you like what I learned from it and also like what the actual resolution of that was. It was kind of interesting. And then we're also gonna play a little bit with RKE2, which is the Rancher Kubernetes engine. I guess the second version of it. Um, and we're going to look at how Cilium deploys there. Um, and, there. and it actually turns out it can be done in a couple of different ways. And so we're going to kind of explore them and, and play with how that all works. So let's go ahead and get started. I hope that you all are having getting ready for an awesome weekend. Um, for a lot of us here in the US, this is going to be a three-day weekend. I hope that's true for you. It's always nice to have a three-day weekend. If you're in the chat or if you're watching this live, go ahead and say hello to me. Let me know you're out there. I appreciate it. And let's get started with the overview here. So these notes are kept. They are um, available to you to edit. You can edit things that you're interested in talking about. Um, these notes can be reached at hackmd.io slash echo live. Just this link here at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen and you would be able to see any published notes. This is episode 37, so you would see them. Hello, Christian in Peru, good to see you. What time is it in Peru, I wonder? I haven't actually considered that. It must be pretty early. <clears throat> so my first piece of news and my really only piece of news that I'm really gonna focus on today is this one here, KubeCon EU. It's coming up. It's going to happen soon. And we have four days remaining to get eBPF submissions in for eBPF Day Europe. So this, uh, the day will be May 16th, 2022 in beautiful Valencia, Spain. If you are interested in hosting a, or in presenting a talk uh, at eBPF Day, either as a recorded talk or in a live talk, go ahead and submit that talk today or in the next three days, you only have four days remaining left to do it. So if you'd like to get something out there, make sure you get something out there soon. Otherwise, we may not be able to consider it for the event. Um, if you're interested in finding this, you can actually catch me. You can, you can follow the link in the HackMD or you can um, just uh, you know check out Twitter and you'll see me tweeting about this uh, right here. So the, uh, the link is events.linuxfoundation.com. Dot org, And if you go there and you look at events, you're going to be able to see the um, Cloud Native EBBF Day in Europe from May 16th. And if you'd like to register or submit to speak, you have four days remaining to do it. And the show is about 12 weeks away. So it should be really exciting. I really hope you'll be there. I'm planning on being there in person. And if you're there with me, that would be awesome. Mr. Nick Lane, good to see you, sir. Awesome to have you on. All right. So if you want to get a talk in, do it now. Don't wait. Just do it. If you have questions about how to do that, if you want some help reviewing your submission or anything else like that, hit me up. Um, my Twitter, my DMs are open, um, and I would love to help get that moving forward with you. So do let me know. Now, when last we met our heroes, we were talking... Uh, we were working through episode 35, which was talking about Kubernetes topology aware routing and Cilium. And this is a new feature, um, and it's a it's behind a feature gate in in Kubernetes 1.23, and that feature gate is topology aware hints. Um, I'm going to show you how uh, to configure things to make these things work. And so, like, this is my kind configuration that you saw me using last time. And inside of here, I've enabled that feature gate, the topology aware hints piece of it. And then part of the other configurations that I've done inside of that kind cluster is I disabled kube proxy. And I disabled the default CNI that comes with kind, which is kindnet. And then we deployed Cilium. There were some other changes that I made here. I made sure that I deployed the, the uh, kubelets with a topology label, telling them which topology I want them to be in or which zone I want them to be in. And then down below here, I had the kind start command. I was targeting version 123.3 here. And I named the cluster Cilium just to keep it simple and know which one I'm talking to. And then here is the Cilium install command that we use to get this thing going. Hey, Chaco, good to see you. 
And then here we're actually using cube proxy, we're replacing cube proxy with the function, the same functionality in Cilium. So Cilium will handle all of the east-west load balancing for services within our Kubernetes cluster. And what we were actually looking to validate was that we would be able to uh, uh, that we would be able to actually make use of topology aware hints within it. So in this configuration of Cilium, I basically told it to use cube proxy replacement strict. I've given it this string, k8 service host, and this is important because since Cilium is the replacement for cube proxy, we have to tell the Cilium agent how to talk to the API server. For the most part, you can rely on cube proxy to handle that question of like, how do I talk to the API server? But if we're replacing cube proxy, then you have to tell us how to do it, right? And so we have this string here in our configuration that tells it this is the host name or eh, of the control plane inside of kind for a, for a cluster named Cilium. And then what port to talk to. And then this feature here is actually enabling the service, the ability to um, configure topology aware hints. And then this last thing that I've configured is just telling it to use the IPAM that, um, that uh, kind of it's already configured with. So we're going to use the Kubernetes IPAM mode. <clears throat> the final file in this example is the thing that we use to set up our test environment. And this is basically just a little bash script that creates a, a number of pods. The goal here is to put two pods, uh, two pods that are like statically defined on each node and to have each of those pods have a name that is that gives us a pretty good view into where these things are deployed. What is the difference between topology hints and zone node information that can be found in an endpoint slice? They are the same. The topology hints are really a, the ability for the um, controller manager to further the information in, a, in an endpoint slice so that if you were like in AWS and you had uh, your Kubernetes cluster deployed across multiple zone, multiple, multiple um, um, re not regions, but zones, yeah. So you have US West 1A, US West 1B, right? And your goal is to deploy your application such that it's balanced across those two zones. And you wanna make sure that you're not sending your traffic across those zones and incurring the cost of transit between those two zones. Maybe you want to just have something that keeps that topology aware of the zone that the traffic is in. So the way that topology aware hints works is that it will actually further instrument the endpoint slice such that when the traffic is, yeah, availability zone, exactly. When the, tra when the traffic is um, coming from your client application, it will determine what zone that client application is coming from and only route traffic to those endpoints that are within the same zone as your client application. Which is pretty cool. I mean, it's a pretty handy feature. All right, so let's play with this a little bit and then I'll show you what I ran into last time and how this was actually fixed. So it's a little bit of a deep explanation. I'm gonna talk about it real quickly, but effectively what happened before was that I had um, configured my up top at proc cmd line. This is your command line for your for your uh, Linux kernel. I'm running a Linux kernel, and inside of here, I had configured this such that I was using Docker cgroups v1. So if I were to do Docker info and do a grep for group. This here, where it says cgroup version, this was cgroups v1. And uh, further, when I create a kind cluster, like I've got here, right? If I do kubectl get nodes, I can see that I have like six nodes deployed, and they're all uh, running inside of, Kubernetes, inside of Docker containers. Now, the interesting thing about Docker is that each of these containers is using the same kernel. And that means that instead of having kubelets that are on different machines, all of my kubelets are sharing the same Linux kernel. And when I had cgroups v1 turned on, I was actually limiting uh, Cilium's ability to understand some of the more intricate details about that endpoint slice mechanism. And so I wasn't actually uh, 
so before what happened was when I was trying to actually do some testing with the, with some of this traffic, I wasn't actually seeing it balance across the endpoints that had been defined. And that's because those endpoints, uh, and that's because the uh, each of the agents was configuring the kernel in such a way that it considered it was it considered it was the only Linux kernel associated with that particular node. But in fact, every node in my cluster is using the exact same Linux kernel, not the same version, but the same one. And that means that they have to play a little nicer with each other. Now we have programmed that and we test it every day and we test it in our CI with Cgroups v2 enabled, but we didn't test it with Cgroups v1 enabled and that's what caught me out. So, so here are all of my agents, or all of my pods that I've deployed inside of my cluster. Um, and you can see that I have, yeah, exactly. It was an interesting, it was an interesting challenge. So labels. I've got these instrumented in such a way that a couple of different things is happening, right? So I have the name of the pod, Echo 1 and Echo 2. So there's two, uh, there's two types, there's two pods on each worker. And then I've labeled these things such that I can actually see what zone they're in, right? So these two are in zone A, these two are in zone B, these two are in zone C, et cetera. So if I do a get pods dash L zone A, I'll be able to see all of the pods that are in zone A. And you can see that that's, those are any pods that are on worker and worker two. Now, if I did kubectl get nodes, uh, show labels, I can see that I have an annotated my nodes with zone information as well. So, topology Kubernetes zone, right? So if I do get nodes dash L, I look for that label of zone A, and I can see that this all lines up, right? The two, the four pods that are in zone A are on worker and worker two. It works. Now, because I've enabled that feature, I'm able to see my service here that I've defined as well. So it'll get SVC. Oh, and that's my second one. So that's the service that I've defined. And if I do kubectl get sv or describe svc, oh, I can see that I have enabled this topology aware hence annotation for this service. And this is actually how you enable this feature to be used inside of your cluster, right? And so in this case, any pod that I deploy, if I deploy that pod into any of these zones, it's only going to see it's only going to send traffic to some subset of those endpoints that are within the same zone as the pod is deployed as the client application is deployed to. So let's see how this works a little bit under the covers, and I'll show you a little bit more like about some of the troubleshooting I was doing before. So to Nick's point earlier, get, get endpoint slice. Go dash o yama. When I actually, you know what? I'm going to turn off the annotation first, and then I'll show you. Control Q kettle annotate. I'm going to dis I'm going to decouple that annotation, right? So now what happens is if I do my describe service, I don't see that annotation any longer associated. Now, if I look at the endpoint um, slice, I can see this. I can see this is basically how it's defined inside of the endpoint slice. So every endpoint that is associated with this service is actually annotated with a zone. And this happens whether you have endpoint slices enabled or not, right? So this pod is located in this zone, zone C, zone A, zone B. Now for the hints part, the hints part works like this. If I annotate that service auto and I look at that endpoint slice again, we can see that we have a new field that has been populated on each of these endpoints. 
and we have configured each endpoint such that we understand this hint, this topology hint. And it's saying that these endpoints are associated with zone B, or this endpoint is associated with zone B, and this endpoint is associated with zone C. And that's the topology hint. That's the, that's the feature we're here to test, right? Like that's actually that functionality. And the way that we can actually determine if that functionality is working is we could do something like exec dash ti or exec dash n kube system. Yes, psyllium dash psyllium. EPF LB list, and then we'll just grab for the port that we care about, which is port 8080. Okay, that's the port we're listening on. And we can see that the this is the view of the service when it is configured according to the hint, right? And so for this particular version of, for this particular instance of the Cilium agent, when I try to access that service IP address, this traffic will be balanced across those endpoints. So any pod associated with this particular node, when it tries to resolve those endpoints by that service, it will only resolve those four endpoints. And if I de-annotate again, like we did before, I look at that same output, you're going to see all of the endpoints for the service. And I annotate again. Look at the output, and we see only those endpoints that are specific to the um, to that particular zone that that agent is deployed to. So that's how the functionality is supposed to work. Now, here is what actually happened when we tested this out, right? So kubectl get pods. You can see we have all of our agents, and if I do kubectl run it bash image equals. Bash. What this does is it just creates like a little um, Alpine Linux bash instance. And it puts it on a random node. So if I disconnect and I do kubectl get pods dash o wide, you can see that this bash instance was deployed to Cilium Worker 2, which we know from our previous ex example is in zone uh, A. So now I'm going to exec into this guy, kubectl exec ti dash n, actually, uh, Bash. Bash. Add curl here. I'm going to curl echo dot svc default dot svc. I'm going to grip for the zone. I'm going to make it less verbose. I'm going to watch that. Watch. In fact, I think I'm going to break this out a little bit more. I'm going to do an egrep. I'm going to look at my output real quick. I want to get another, I want to get a host name in there. Host name. Yeah. So we're going to look for. So we can see that we're balancing our traffic across multiple pods, right? We have Echo 1 and Echo 2, Echo 1 work, Cilium Worker, and Echo 2 Cilium Worker. So we're actually balancing it across those four endpoints. Now, before when we did this test, we saw this still balancing across the whole world. It wasn't actually balancing across some subset of pods. It was balancing across the whole set. And we we're like, what is going on? But that was actually what was happening was that we didn't see the right mapping in C groups V2 we weren't able to detect that but in c groups feed uh, sorry in c groups v1 in c groups v2 things work accordingly and so we're able to see that change so let's do one more test here let's go ahead and do our our d annotation again that we saw before notate and what do you think will happen 
Now we're in zone B. Zone A again. And there was a zone C. So actually able to see this working the way we expect. Yeah. And if I annotate this back, equals auto. And we are immediately thrown back into zone A only. Pretty cool. So that was a kind of a, a follow follow up on the most recent episode episode number thirty five. Um, and if you want to try this out, if you want to try this out, you can try this out uh, inside of your environment. I've gone ahead and included all of the detail in episode thirty five's um, Hack MD. So if you want to try it out, give it a try. Let me know how it goes. It should have everything you need to try it out. But yeah, let me know if that doesn't work out. Cool. So you can think you can definitely consider this as somewhat of an advanced use case because I'm trying to do this with Docker containers. And for the most part, we actually do this with real nodes. And so I was going to show you what I did to try this out on a real node also. All right. Even more fun stuff. So I have this box that's running in uh, I think it's in Google Cloud right now. It's a it's a just a Google it's just a nested virtualization instance. And you've seen me talk about this box and this configuration before in the OpenShift discussion that we had a few weeks ago. Um, and you can do this pretty much anywhere you have um, Libvirt and uh, Vagrant deployed together. So I have Vagrant and the Libvirt um, Vagrant provider configured inside of this host. And what I've done further is I've defined a Vagrant file. So I'm going to walk you through that Vagrant file real quick and show you what kind of what I've been up to here. So there are a couple of prerequisites for Kubernetes that make your life better. And one of the things that makes your life better about Kubernetes is if you already know what the host name is and you know that those host names are uh, directly mapped to IP addresses that are stable. And that way, if you had to restart a box or if the box reboots or anything, then you come back with that same IP address and that same uh, host name. So to that end, I've done a little bit of work here. I've defined what the network will look like inside of libvirt. And I've defined this libvirt network directly in uh, using using uh, the Ruby libvirt library to actually go ahead and do it. And so I've defined that there will be four hosts, and I've given them static MAC addresses. And I've associated those static MAC addresses with uh, reserved IP addresses. So anything that tries to come up and talk to the DHCP server and say, I am 0301, then you are going to get the 20131 IP address. And this is going to be your host name. Right? I've, configured it, I've configured it that way inside of the libvirt networking mechanism. And then down below, when I'm defining my machines, I'm also defining that MAC address so that when, the, when those virtual machines are started up, I'm predefining what the MAC address will be when associated with the management network. And that way I can tie that in, right? So these, these hosts always have the same IP whenever they come up or whenever they go away. Makes my life easier for restarting and all of that stuff. Now, some of the other things I've done inside of here is I've configured um, a couple of different libraries here in the front. And if you want to see this in kind of a more, uh, maybe an easier to see way, if you go to our HackMD notes for this week, again, are right here on your lower right-hand corner, hackmd.io slash echo live. Hello, Josh. Good to see you. Then I put the Vagrant file in here as well. So you can actually look at how I'm doing this and like what this looks like and all that stuff in here. I want to do something a little bit more dynamic with this piece of it, like leveraging um, some uh, some templating stuff instead of actually like statically defining it. But I haven't gotten around to that yet. Uh, as I proceed with that, I'll probably end up like throwing a project up that actually does that somewhat dynamically. But for now, this static definition works pretty well. And if you have Vagrant and Libvirt deployed, you should be able to make use of it. So going back here. There are a couple of other things I've done. Uh, I, since I'm using the um, generic Ubuntu 2004 image, 
I've defined a fix to the DNS because that image, for some mysterious reason, actually tries to define its its DNS dire uh, directly, and it really breaks the world. And so this is just a little script that makes it so that it leverages the DNS that is handed to it by libvirt, not some static set of DHC, uh, DNS servers that were configured by NetPlan. And that fixes it right up. The next thing I did is I defined a server line, a server, a server code chunk and an agent code chunk. And these are actually used to define the configuration for Rancher Kubernetes Engine 2. And the way that you do that is you create a file that's called config.yaml. And you place that file on the file system at Etsy Rancher RKE2. And here, in, inside of that file, you can define some parameters that allow you to configure RKE2 however you want. So again, since in my configuration, this control plane node is cp01.c1.k8.work, I need to add that um, FQDN to the SAN, this TLS SAN line here. And so I've populated the TLS SAN to say that this is going to be the, this is the, for this particular agent, this is the host name. I've defined a static token, Vagrant RKE2, and this token is going to be used by all of the agents in RKE2 speak to register with that control plane. The other thing I've done is just like in kind, I didn't want it to deploy a CNI. I wanted to deploy the CNI myself. And so I set CNI to none. Now, one thing I wanted to point out, which I thought was pretty interesting on the rancher side, you do have the option to uh, deploy Cilium directly. And so you can, there is a thing called RKE Cilium, which is a Helm chart that rancher will deploy for you that will deploy Cilium as an underlying CNI for your cluster directly. Now, I wanted to do some customization, so I'm not going to follow that path. But if you just wanted to like get an RKE cluster and use Cilium as an underlying CNI and not do anything funky or special, then you could just you can just do that directly using this mechanism. <clears throat> but that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing this. So inside of here, I've actually disabled that. Um, I've told it not to deploy a CNI. That's what CNI none means. And then just like in my kind configuration, I needed to enable that feature gate, the topology aware hints feature gate, such that uh, I could turn that on. Now this job tracking one, this is something that um, RKE does by default and I didn't want to mess with the defaults. So I just coupled that in there. For the feature gate to work, you need to apply it to the API server and the controller manager. Um, I would expect that we would have to apply it to kube proxy, but in this case, since we're not deploying kube proxy, we don't have to worry about that configuration. And then right down here on these next two lines are how we're disabling kube proxy inside of this RKE cluster. For newer versions of RKE, they actually have they've been deploying kube proxy as a static pod, and so to disable it for those newer versions, you have to do disable dash kube proxy true. In the older versions, they were using a, a Helm chart to deploy kube proxy. And if you want to disable any of the Helm charts that are defined by default inside of Rancher Kubernetes Engine, you can create this section that's called Disable and then list those things that you want to disable. And then right here is how I'm installing the Rancher Kubernetes Engine piece. So, so easy. I don't have to install Container D. I don't have to do any of the other work that has to happen at the lower level on a node because they have compiled all of that, all of the dependencies and everything right into the server binary. Pretty wild, kind of blows my mind when I think about it, but we're gonna take a look at how that is uh, laid down on the file system here in just a second. But it really kind of, I was like, wow, that, that's cool. you know. So inside of here, I'm telling it what version of RKE2 I want to deploy and you can get that version directly from the RKE2 website. If you go to RK, get RKE2.io, it'll give you the list of versions that are available. Or you can go to the GitHub project and see those releases. I'm running 1.23.3, just like I did in kind, because I wanted to see this feature set tested in 1.23.3. And I'm really doing a curl to shell to install it. Don't hate, you know, it just makes my life easy. And then I'm doing system enable, system CTL enable now RKE2 service. 
And this is only on the server node, the CP01 node. On the agents, I have a more generic configuration, right? Where I don't have anything specific other than saying that the server will be CP01C1K8s.work. And then the important bit is that you point at the rancher listening port for that. And then the token that I'll use to authenticate is that static token that I've already defined just above. And then instead of starting the RKE2 server service, I'm starting the RKE2 agent service. Well, that's an overview of the Vagrant file. Let's go ahead and get things started up here and take a look at how this works. Now, let's just go ahead and destroy that. And we'll start, we'll bring it up again. So in parallel, it's starting those four VMs, three workers and one control plane node. As soon as those machines are started up, we go through the provisioning process. Right up here at the top, actually, um, way up here at the beginning, we can see whether, the, whether the, uh, the network has been defined, right? So right here is this VM net trigger. This is actually when I'm defining the network, leveraging the libvirt Ruby library to define it. But when I go to define the, the network on worker one, it just says network already defined and network already defined for worker three, right? Because it's already been done. So we don't want to recon, we don't want to redefine it. And then down below, it actually shows me those things that are running, right? So here's my fixed DNS script. And then here's my RKE agent script that's running. And then I also have an RKE server shell script that's running. It's grabbing the version of RKE that I asked it to download. And then it's going ahead and um, done a system de-enable on that, on those services. So now that should be forming my Rancher Kubernetes engine cluster without doing anything more than just using the Ubuntu 2004 image and using RKE as a, as a shell installer. Pretty wild. So stick a second while it goes through its process, because basically we're, um, I did a system D enable now, which means that it's going to wait until the service is completely up before releasing the, the link. And so this tells me that um, once I have actually received, once it's actually completely up, then I'll be able to see it release and see things connect. Let's give this a second or two. Hope you all have some good plans for the weekend. How, how many? How many of you are actually going to have a three-day weekend over this next weekend? I hope. I hope most of you. But here in the U.S., we're celebrating President's Day, and so we are actually getting a three-day weekend this weekend. It's going to be pretty awesome. If I do uh, cube kettle, actually, what I need to do next is grab the the, um, the configuration file, and the way that I can do that is that we're going to be know ah. Oh, probably because you're going to be busy, most likely. So inside here, uh, I have this command that's actually going to SSH into my cp01c1k.work node. And from the file system, it's going to grab this rke2.yaml file. And that is an administrative credential that RKE creates on the control plane nodes that you can use to interact with your Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's configured by default to, to point to localhost. And I wanted to change that configuration to point to the host name. And then I'm going to drop that right into my local file system and make that my default kubeconfig. So there we have it. We have our Kubernetes cluster deployed. We have uh, our one control plane node, and we have each of three worker nodes. We have, we're running version v123.3 and it's the RKE engine release one. So uh, it all worked pretty well. If I do kubectl get pods dash A, I can see what's already deployed. 
And so I have my API server, my controller manager, my scheduler. You can see etcd here. There is a cloud controller manager running. Um, and then I have this stuff here, the Helm install RKE uh, bits that RKE2 comes with, right? So it's going to deploy Core DNS, it's going to deploy Ingress, and it's going to deploy the, deploy the metric server. But we can see that not very many things are running, and that's because of this status right here where it says not ready. We haven't deployed Cilium, so we need to get it around to doing that. So there's a couple of different ways we can do that, but I think we should probably just leverage the same mechanism that we did in our kind cluster. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and copy that over to the host. Flame install. We're going to SCP that over here to there, and then move them install to here and we're going to edit it because some of the things that are in that install are different for this cluster than they were for that cluster specifically this bit right here cp01.c1.kh.work and then I think it's still 6443. Yeah, I didn't change that. And there's us turning on our load balancer service topology piece. And there is leveraging the IPAM mode, the Kubernetes IPAM mode. So same install, still using Cilium Stillium, still using version 111.1. The only thing I had to really change was this K8 service host because I'm because that has to point at the API server for us to actually re replace Cube Proxy. All right. Do kubectl config. This is a way of actually determining what those parameters will be for that string. Like if you do kubectl config view, you're going to be able to see like the server line and the port. And so I just need to make sure that that is configured according accordingly in my install. Okay. Server line and port. You line up with that right there. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and do our actually. Do I have that installed? Helm repo list. Oh, Helm repo add Cilium. Yes, Helm .cilium .io. Repo update. And I have my Helm, uh, I have Helm configured such that it can actually deploy this thing. So I'll just go ahead and do bash Cilium install. I'll get pods dash and kube system. And there we can see that we're installing Cilium. And there we go. Now this was leveraging Helm outside the cluster to deploy Cilium leveraging like the Helm command that I ran from the command line. But there's another way to do it with RKE2, which is actually pretty cool. And I'm going to show you that as well. Um, but first, let's go ahead and do our testing here. My plans for this weekend, I am actually planning on going up to Ronit Park and spending some time with our family up there. And then next week, the back end of the week, I'm actually going to take some time off and really, uh, you know, spend, because my kid is going to have like an intercession, which is like a two week break toward the beginning of the year. And so I'll be spending some time with fam and getting the heck out of town for a little bit. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. All right. So if I do kubekit, I'll get pods dash A. Something's mad at me. Mm 
All right, so we're all the way up and running. Things are working. If I do psyllium, uh, connectivity test. So we have a kind of validating your, your psyllium deployment. Uh, in another window, I'm going to jump over here and do... Psyllium. And then psyllium status. And it will show me that all four pods, all psyllium pods are up and running. And this is the version that we're operating. And we're seeing all of the things get deployed and working correctly. So there we go. So that was leveraging like Helm directly as a command. Should we get topology hints working on this thing before we break off? Because like, that'll be our next step. So if we're going to do that, there are a couple other things I would need to do, which I did not do already. I do kubectl get nodes dash a show labels. I have not associated these with a zone. So what I'll have to do is go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and start there. So we'll, the test is passing. Let's go ahead and um, jump into our C1 cluster with all of our hints here. The label that I want to apply is topology k topologykubernetes.io. Topology kubernetes.io. So I'll just do kubectl get nodes dash o name. Kubectl label node cp0 uh, worker zero one, and then we'll drop our topology label in there. A two. Three. Now if I did kubectl get nodes dash l topology kubernetes dot io zone. These are all the nodes that have that uh, label. And then if I wanted to look at just a or just b or just c. See that stuff. So that's now got a topology label. So any services defined will actually have that information, right? So if I do kubectl get pods, I can see I don't have anything defined in here. Let's go ahead and scpr pods.sh over to that'll be our way of creating these pods instead of here. So Change our host names around a little bit. Look at nodes. Odds work for this. One. Two, three, definitely a different set of a different number of workers. We had like six before. It's that this will be A, no, this will be B, this will be C. That all implies four worker in. Worker zero three that works, and then 
create our service. All right. Did I put that in there? Core worker and worker zero. Yeah, it's in there. Leading zeros. We're talking about. Oh, you're right. Good catch. Looks like. There. Let's try and deploy this thing. Let's see what we see. Keep kettle get pods. FL zone equals A. B. C. Keep it all describe. Actually, get endpoint slice echo demo. And we can see that inside of here, we already have that feature that we were talking about before, right? So I haven't turned anything on other than just giving a topology, a topology key to each node. And then as it defines inside of the endpoint slice, it's going to define which node it's in and which zone that node is part of. Looks good. If I were to do that same command that we ran before, I exec into the Cilium agent, and kube system ds Cilium, Cilium bpf lb list grep 8080. I have more 8080s here. Uh, let's see, keep it'll get SVC. So this is the one that I'm looking at. Okay. So anytime anything sends traffic on this node toward 3639, it's going to balance that traffic across these endpoints, across all three hosts. And if I do my annotation, uh, which I don't remember what it is, but let's see. I do that same LB list. Oh, make a liar of me. Look at that. It's still not it's still running against the set. Thirty nine. Let's see if my hints are actually in the correct spot. Let's do a cube kettle. Uh, at endpoint slice echo oh in this case what's happening is you see the thing that's missing from this is that there's no hints it's not creating the hints for us So that means that the service isn't being hit. There's no hint here for us to pick up on. So we're not actually, you know, picking up on it and making it work. So I wonder why topology hints isn't working here. At all. Let's just make sure that we have this configured correctly. So I'll do kubectl get pod dash n cube system controller manager. Oh. to no, cube controller manager. Oh, YAML, grep, oh, So the running controller manager definitely sees the topology where hints true. Yeah, good question. That's great minds think alike. That's exactly what I was thinking about.
Hmm. Let's see here. Why would that not be working? I disable it. Enable it again. Does anything change? Turn it off, turn it on again, you know? Log session, Kube system, Kube controller manager. Start seeing the zones. That all looks okay. It is the controller manager that's doing this work. Hmm. I don't think there's anything in, in here that would help us understand. Oh, look at that. That's our problem. Can't get CPU or zone information for worker three node. And I'll get nodes dash o. What it's looking for is it's looking to understand the CPU capacity for each node. It looks like we're reporting that. So I'm going to go ahead and do a custom columns here because I want to see this. So I want to see status. Capacity. Get all get nodes. So custom columns. Oops. Name dot metadata name. CPU. Status dot capacity. CPU. We are reporting and we do see allocatable, right? Allocatable, yeah. Hmm. Point slice. We're seeing the zone associated with it, but we're not seeing the topology. I don't get SVC. Go. If that were true, then there would be no running pods. So Nick says it looks like Cilium wasn't operating on worker three. Cilium is definitely operating on worker three. Otherwise, there would be no pods on worker three. But yeah, at some point before, it looked like it wasn't right. You saw conditions. Oh yeah, that's actually a misnomer. Same is up. 
Selenium is running on this node and it says status false, which I think is probably a bug because maybe we should rename this reason to Selenium is down. <laughs> yeah, that's a bug. That's a good catch. The language of conditions is always kind of weird, right? Because like in here it says like, you know, for example, Kubelet has sufficient memory available. Reason, Kubelet has sufficient memory false type memory pressure but we know that that's actually not the case like it's not in a it's not in a memory pressure state so these things are you know sometimes they're kind of hard to grok correctly the way that they are written but it's unfortunate yeah if this if this were in a state where it was memory pressure then the status wouldn't be ready yeah, you're not crazy. Not crazy in this way. You might still be crazy, but not not like this. You know, I'm just saying. Anyway, let's try turning it off and turning it on again, just one more time. See what happens. Because I have seen this work. I. SVC dash n endpoint slice. Yeah, I think the problem is still like maybe that the controller manager is just not getting the news. Because it is moving to normal at some point. On a lark, let's try doing this. Ah, that was the other thing I was going to show you about this RKE stuff that kind of blew my mind. So, um, yeah. Let's check this out. So, underneath var lib rancher is the world of RKE2. <laughs> Uh, that's the that's the bin directory, and then the agent, the data server, all the all of the stuff that you would normally go looking for in Kubernetes land is all inside of here. If I go into agent, I see things like pod manifests. So these are the pod manifests associated with the cluster right now. These are the static pods that are actually running the controller manager. Um, and if I were to remove this one, for example, so if I move a cube controller manager back a directory, and I do pgrep controller manager we'll see it not running but if i were to do pgrep api server i still see it running grep is a great tool because it like it's basically like ps minus cf pipe grep but just for that particular process so now if i move that controller manager back in and i do pgrep controller manager Uh, here we go. <clears throat> now it's running, and we can see that the, it's running as PID 5540. And in further explorations of this stuff, one of the things that you can do, you can do air kettle, yes, oh, but you have to do it with some that server uh, 
Or for you to. Let me dash. Let's see where I go. There we go. Cat agent. Let's see. Let's do CP agent Etsy Sierra Kettle YAML into Etsy. That just moves that file into the hosts Etsy. So now when I go into here and I do Sierra Kettle, yes, I can see all of the things that are running inside of the containerizer. But even in this output, you can see what's happening. So this container D implementation is the one that they got from K3S, right? They're running container D directly. CTR, uh, what is it? Tasks. Ah, because it doesn't think that it's actually connected, right? You have to give it the, you have to give it the uh, address that you're on. You have to tell it where to find it. Agent cat. Let's see. And the address is So there's the namespace that we're in. So if I do dash n, get h.io, and then I do cls, I'll be able to see all the containers running. So that was kind of super hieroglyphic, but basically these are some of the ways that you can interact with what's happening under the covers. I really do like Sierra Kettle, but yeah, it's uh, the rest can be kind of a pain to get to. But yeah, all of this stuff is running as part of the Rancher Kubernetes engine install. I didn't have to install Container D. I didn't have to configure the CNI. All of the stuff that's here is actually done by them, not by us, but not, not by anything I did intentionally. So you can see all those pause containers. You can see everything that's running on this node. You can interact with the low levels of what's happening in the in the kubelet. Um, yeah, I was actually, I'm super impressed by how all of this works. But yeah. Good stuff. I cannot figure out why. Well, but let's see if it's still happening. So if we do we back out of here again, we do kubectl get endpoint slices, echo, echo yaml. Yeah, we're not seeing any of the, oh, hey, look, hints. We got hints. Weirdly, Restarting the controller manager got us back in play. That's probably a bug too. Bum, bum, bum. 
All right. So let's try our other test. Now that we have hints, hey, it's working. Our hints are working. Yeah, it's always the way. Exactly. We can restart everything all the time. That's one of my favorite definitions of SRE. Simply restart everything. It's perfect. So now what we see is once we actually kicked the controller manager a little bit, um, we were able to actually see, it was able to uh, detect the CPU uh, stuff probably, and now it's able to actually engage with C topology hits. By default, if the controller manager doesn't see CPU allocatable from the nodes, then it won't actually do topology hints. So that behavior makes sense. Like if the, for whatever reason, like when it was registering the nodes as part of the topology cache, it didn't populate the CPU load. And so it wasn't able, or the, the CPU allocatable. And so the node, uh, and so the um, topology hints weren't applying. But now they are, and we got it working. And that's pretty exciting. And that's a great way to end our session for this wonderful Friday. Um, if you want to play along at home, like I said, I have put these notes into the uh, HackMD, and we can explore that stuff further. So thank you all so much for hanging out with me. I hope that this was helpful. I find it pretty fascinating, but, you know, I'm weird like that. I'm sure that some of you are weird that way as well. Enjoy yourselves. I'll see you all next time.